Like I said, I was in the department for 28 years. I started in 1984. And in those days, basically, you just walked in off the street and you said you were interested. And basically, they would literally measure your height, your, take your weight, ask if you had to grade, have grade 12. And you didn't even have grade 12 then. You just needed a grade 10. And then they put you on a waiting list. And uh, after about six months or so or a year, they give you a call. You go do a physical, a little aptitude test, like what, what is one plus one type of thing. You'd be amazed how many people fail it. And then you get in, and you started from the ground floor. You literally had six weeks of training, and basically they taught you how to catch a hydrant, how to take hose off a truck, how to start a truck, how to drive a truck, and how to actually put water on the fire. Those days are gone. And no longer is that going to apply. Very, basically, you have to have minimum grade 12 to even start. Now, if you want to get into the fire service, you have to go to a, what they call a FAR college. There's some local ones here. Brandon comes to mind. And it, it's an accredited program. Uh, you, you actually even have to apply like you would at University of Winnipeg or U of M. You actually have to apply to go to the fire, Brandon Fire College. There, then once you apply and if you meet some of the criteria they lay out for you, then you uh, go for an interview, take a physical, and then you go on a waiting list and you take the course there. Like I told you, my training was six weeks long Theirs is 10 months long now. And it basically, it's an eight, you have to have a, a passing grade of 80% or you, you don't get out. Now, the beauty of it, though, is old guys like me are retiring. And the world is open to you guys as far as the, an emergency service, whether it be paramedic or fire. The baby boomers are all going. And it's like guys like me. Actually, I could have retired a year ago, but my son is keeping me working because he's only in grade 10. But that's my fault. So now we're, the guy's coming in, it's, as, as we're retiring, there's a lot of vacancies available. So anybody who gets in, into this field or wants to get in this field, uh, it's the only organization I know where you can go to the fire college, graduate, let's say out of Brandon, and you actually can get 100% placement, which is pretty good. Now, it might not be in Winnipeg. Uh, you may be needing to go travel or be willing to travel somewhere else, maybe Calgary, Regina, Vancouver. But as long as it's a recognized institution like Brandon, I went to Oklahoma State University, there's a college in Texas, there's colleges everywhere. As long as it's a recognized institution, you're going to be able to get a job somewhere. It could be in forestry. It could be with the fire, fire commissioner's office with the province. It could be with Winnipeg, Brandon, Thompson. Thompson has an excellent fire department. might not be that big, but it is there. So don't, don't limit yourself to just Winnipeg. I know a lot of people from Winnipeg want to work here, but a lot, I know a lot of uh, people or kids who actually end up going to work, say, in London, Ontario, get some experience there in a smaller service, and then tr try and get into a bigger one. So that's available to you. Now, so let's say you go to Brandon or Vermilion, Alberta, and you graduate and you get on the job. What can you expect? Well, the thing is you can't become chief right off the hop. Heck, I'm not even the chief, and I've been here for 28 years, unfortunately. There's only one chief in every department, but you, can't, you have to start like anything else at the bottom. And basically, your job is going to be starting uh, either as a paramedic right off the base or as a firefighter, uh, usually a hydrant man. Now, a hydrant man is the guy who actually takes the hose off the truck, connects it to the hydrant, and gets water to the truck. doesn't sound very exciting or romantic, but... Think of it this way. When you get into the fire service, we're called a semi-military operation. And what that means is we very much work in teams. If anybody curls, the lead is any, nowhere near as good as if he doesn't have a good lead. And it's the same thing in the fire service. If the guy's taking the hose off the truck, is going to the house to put out the fire, and he doesn't have any water because the hydro man doesn't know his job, it's not very good. If you don't have a captain who actually, or a driver doesn't know the streets, you're not going to get there. So each four members of that crew rely on each other. So basically that's where you start as a hydrant man. Gain a little experience, earn the trust of the crew that they can trust you because literally you're fighting for other people's lives, you're fighting for your life in a situation that's out of control and you're trying to bring it back into control. So if you can't rely on the person who's beside you, uh, that's not a good situation. So you, you need to earn people's trust in this job. And then once you get that, then they say, hey, he's, he actually, she knows or he knows what the heck he's doing then you, they will might get you to try driving for a while to see if you know your streets. From there on, maybe they'll get you to get in, the, the actual person to get in and put out the fire. 
And then later on as a captain, those are usually the gray-haired fellows with the big pots on them. They're because they've been around and eaten so much in the hall that they get pretty out of shape. But they're the ones who actually assess the scene and determine, are we going in, are we not? Uh, are we doing a search and rescue to try and find victims first, or are we actually going to try to put out the fire? So that's where you start off. And uh, basically, um, I know most of you want to know, well, what is, where do these guys get paid? An entry-level firefighter, such as a hydrant man, basically starts at about $55,000. That's the start. All right, so within uh, six months, you're already jumping up another five. And every year they're on up to the first five years, you've jumped from 55 to about $78,000. All right, that's, that's just entry level. And then you get to go on, like they were talking about, uh, Eva was describing my progression, where I had gone. And there's all kinds of fields um, in firefighting even. There's lots of other things you can do. If you don't get, uh, you get tired of just fighting fires, you can actually apply once you get enough time in. You can say, well, I want to try uh, tech rescue. Tech rescue is those guys that actually do the uh, rappelling off the top of the buildings. We call them dope on a rope or spider man. And uh, the actual test to become a tech one is you actually go for training for a couple weeks. You learn about all the different ropes and the carabiners and how to tie knots and things like that. And your test is you actually have to go off the t uh, tr a TD building twice. The first time, they toss you off. The second time, you go off on your own. Okay, now jumping off a 30-foot, 30 30-story 30 building is not a natural act, and I think I still have my claw marks on the edge of that building as I'm going over. So that's tech rescue. You actually get paid a little more to do that. Uh, I was on water rescue. That's really cool because they, they show you how to drive a boat. And we have a pretty good one in Winnipeg. And you, what you do in the summer is you patrol all the, or the, the waterways, catching people who are drunk, basically, and jumping in a river who shouldn't be. But it's kind of cool because you get to sit around with the forks in your shorts and shades, and you get to watch all the girls behind the sunglasses. They don't know that you're staring at them. But that's true. But they think you're not staring at them, but that's why they walk by four or five times. All right? So that's water rescue. You actually get paid a little more to do that. Uh, there's also hazmat. Hazmat is for the um, uh, spills like a uh, fuel container. A tanker truck rolls and spills all its contents on the road. We're in charge of picking that up. Uh, the University of Manitoba has a huge lab there with all kinds of toxic chemicals. There's the virology lab. So you get specialty training to recognize hazardous materials and wear specialty suits. And we call those guys the glow in the dark boys. All right. So again, you get paid more for that. For every little specialty, you get paid a little more. And you can get to do it for a while, back out. And that's in the fire service. Uh, I took a different route after about 15, 16 years in the fire hall where you see all kinds of great things and all kinds of terrible things. I decided to take a different track. And I decided to try and take um, inspections. And basically, my job would be come in, and I would inspect this building. And I'd find all kinds of things that are wrong with the building. and then. Uh, nobody liked you much because you ended up calling, costing these people a lot of money because they say, you've got to change this, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. So I wasn't going to last very long in that. It was, training was good, but I didn't really care for it. But the pay increase was really good. There I was probably making even 10 years ago, it was probably about $80,000. So uh, I was going to leave, and the director at the time says, well, we've got this new thing called public education. Would you like to give that a try? And I thought, eh, what the heck, I'll give it a try. And uh, lo and behold, 10 years later, I'm still doing it. They've changed the title from public education to community relations. I do a lot of media stuff, TV, a lot of public speaking. But it's been really good for me in, in that regard. So that's one vocation you can also, once you leave the fire hall, if you want to leave the fire hall, you can go into inspections or you can go into community relations. If you decide that, OK, this is good for my resume, but I've had enough of that, let's say you really want to become chief. The idea is you want to try all these different little things. And there's also a training academy. You can go into the training academy. That's where the rookie firefighters come in, and they need to be upgraded on the systems within the city of Winnipeg. So my job as a training officer would be to bring you up to speed on tech rescue, water rescue, uh, hazmat, all those other little specialties <laughs> that are out there. Um, anybody interested in CSI TV show where you investigate? Well, we actually have that in the city of Winnipeg. We call it arson investigation. It's actually, it's a pretty ni nice little branch. Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay, sorry. 
So you get in there and they train you in arson investigation where we'll go into a scene, like there was just a fire the other day on Home Street, you probably heard in the news, no big secret, it's under investigation, because it's, it's suspicious in nature. Might have to do with the fact that it started outside and there was kids seen around the, and around the neighborhood. But what they'll do is they'll actually scrape away all the remnants and the ashes and we'll actually even be able to get it down to a point where we can tell where the fire started, how hot it got, and we can tell you if it was started by gas, turpentine, kerosene, whatever fuel was used to start this fire. We can even tell you if it was a candle that started it, whatever. And they've got it down so good, if it was a fire started in a carpet, we could actually cut out a piece of the carpet and we'll tell you if it's Texaco, Shell, or Domo gas. We can't tell you what outlet, but we can tell you actually what type of gas that was used. So it's, it's kind of cool. It's uh, a lot of the people who get in there stay in there. They don't come out because they really, really enjoy it. So it's not just water on the fire anymore. There's a lot of specialties in that regard. The uh, service amalgamated to about eight years ago. What I mean by amalgamated used to be paramedics and fire. Fire used to have basic what was called EMT service. You'd basically know how to do CPR, first aid, those types of things. What's happened now is we have a full amalgamation of the paramedics and there that's a whole different world altogether. Even though we work quite closely together, you'll have actually paramedics on the, on the fire trucks. So if you ever get that question, why is the fire truck getting there first? Because there's a lot more fire trucks in the fire service or the paramedic service than there are ambulances. And usually ambulances are quite busy, so the firefighters or the paramedics on the fire trucks will get there first and will prep them for the ambulance. But you have what's called a primary care paramedic. Those are the guys who actually know how to stabilize, give oxygen, uh, stop a bleed, those types of things. And then you can actually progress on from there into what's called ACP, and that's advanced care paramedic. And those are the guys who really have it good because they get to dabble in all kinds of drugs. All right? They can administer drugs, put in IVs. Uh, they call a STEMI program. That's actually where they, they put the tube down the guy's throat. Uh, into the heart and actually get it revived that way so they can actually there it's actually emergency ward in the field it's it's pretty amazing to watch some of these guys I never got to that level I was never really interested in all that but one thing's for certain if you ever get in this field uh, you can't be squeamish of heart uh, the, like once you're in this service really nobody leaves because uh, everybody loves what they're doing but the thing is is there are unpleasantries in this job uh, as much as you work with a team and you stay in the hall and you work in the hall 24-7, uh, you will come across scenes like car, car accidents and you'll see multiple body parts, burnt victims, uh, major bleeds, those types of things. So you sort of have to do a lot of soul searching before you get into this kind of field whether you can handle this type of situation or not. Uh, I mean, but there are great times in that where you actually save people's lives and uh, that's all good too. So keep that in mind when you're doing all that kind of stuff. But as you can see, it's not just water on the, uh, on the fire anymore. There's such a wide range of specialties. Um, notice there's a lot of ladies in the audience. Anybody, uh, as far as uh, women on the job, we started uh, first woman in Winnipeg was in 1988. And since then, we have more women in Winnipeg on the job than all the other major city centers in Canada combined. That's including Toronto, Vancouver. Right, so we have over... I believe 85 women on the job. It's 1,200 people, so we have about, you know, a tenth of the force is actually women now. Uh, what else? You can get into 911. You can get into communications. Anybody's involved in IT, uh, that one is actually you can apply that separately because it really has nothing to do with the hall, but uh, in the fact that you do talk to the crews quite a bit and helping them out in different situations. So that's 911 call center. There's a um, actually pretty good pay scale there too. So that's basically all those levels as far as where you are and each one, like I said, get a little more. Um, paramedics get paid the same thing basically as firefighters. Like right now, as I went into uh, community relations, right now I'm making it about, and I, I know it's, it's all public knowledge, um, People under me are making about 80000 85000 I made close to $100,000 last year, 98000 And I'm not even a chief. The next uh, level is a district chief. He's about one hundred and five. There's And there's 
110 for a platoon chief, and then the deputy chiefs are in the stratosphere of 150. The chief is about 200 grand a year. Uh, the unfortunate part about the chief is there's only one. So, and everybody wants that job because it pays the most money. Now, another thing you need to realize about the fire service and the paramedic service, it's shift work, all right? That means there's four shifts. You got two 10-hour days, two 14-hour nights. So you're working four days straight and then four days off. And with four days, that means there's somebody living there 24-7. So if you're, if you're not a social person and you're not willing to work in a team, this is not the environment for you. It's going to be very, very difficult. You literally live in the fire hall. You literally, these people around you are your family. If you ever get married and have kids, they're literally almost your secondary family. You have your first family in the hall and your second family at home. So that makes it very difficult on marriages. It makes it very difficult on family life because you're just not home most of the time. You're literally living in the hall. We have kitchens, we have dorms, we have gyms for the guys who like to work out. Any good gym you've ever been in in Winnipeg, they're nothing compared to what you have in the hall. We have the best of everything because we live there. Uh, it's, it's not a joke that the best cooks in Winnipeg are in the fire hall. These guys can cook. It's amazing. And that's why some of the other guys, if they're not working out, they get pretty big. And it's just like, oh, my goodness. It's just like top of the, every, every night it's like, okay, what are we having for supper? And it's no such thing as craft dinner, okay? It's always like a sore loin or it's always tenderloin or it's always something. Yeah? Can you have a job as a cook in the kitchen? <laughs> no, you've got to become a firefighter first. Then, then you become the cook. So usually it starts off, the rookie's he's in charge of the breakfast. So you learn how to make breakfast first, and then you sort of learn how to make lunches, and then on to supper. So again, it's a seniority thing. As you get better at it, then you get more demanding, and then you can just get better at it. So, so re remind yourselves of that. Okay? And then while you're, you're at home with your family enjoying Christmas, I'm not. Okay? You're not there with your family at Christmas. You could be working. Sometimes you're off. Sometimes you're on. But the thing is, is you're working literally five out of eight weekends. So if you enjoy your summers, it's great. The four days off, you're off. You can be tanning, but you're tanning alone. And you're usually hanging around with the guys that you work with because there's nobody else off. You have to understand that. It's just, just not the same at all. Like I said, you're working five out of eight weekends. You're just not available. So that's very stressful. Uh, can be very stressful in a person. A lot of times if you're getting calls at night and you're up all night, um, if you're supposed to be off the next day, you're not really off because you're sleeping. Another thing you need to know is um, firefighting is uh, the um, environment you're working in is very toxic. It's full of carcinogens. It used to be in the old days it was just wood, houses, and basically that's all you were taking in. Now we've learned that accumulatively over time uh, from synthetic fabrics, fabrics that are burnt and mixed up in water from the fires we're fighting, it builds into your system over time uh, full of carcinogens and we're far more susceptible for certain cancers than most people in the general public. So I don't make it, I, don't, I just don't want to color code it. I want you to realize if you get into this, yeah, you know, it's, uh, you have to be aware of what's out there. Uh, don't get me wrong, anybody who gets in this service does not leave. We're, we're lifers. In fact, we usually yank them out kicking and screaming. We just had one guy, uh, he, he was forced to retire at 65 because they said, well, you can't fight fighters anymore. And he actually won his, his civil case with human, human rights and they've actually had to reinstate him. He just doesn't want to go. So it's like, okay, you know. But it's, I just want, don't want to sugarcoat it. That being said, like I said, it pays very well. You can hold a high standard of middle class living. Uh, like I said, and you really enjoy it. You have a good circle of friends. You can provide for your family and, and all that. And uh, lots of other benefits actually being through with the city. You also have your vision care. You have a great pension plan. Um, your teeth are paid for. Your eyes are paid for. We have great gyms in the hall. Like I said, all that is a really good package. And I said the, the benefits are really good in that regard. If you can handle the work. Okay. One of the first... Two scenes I was ever at, if you, uh, I'll mention it anyway. Uh, first scene, I was actually working for somebody who was on holidays, and I went to a scene hydro transformer I'd blown up. So we went to it, and it was the ones that were underground on those grids. You know, when you walk over those grids, you need to be aware, over those grids underneath, there's hydro transformers. 
Anyway, this one blew up, and uh, we got there, and there was a little 10-year-old boy who had uh, been standing over it, and there was nothing left. His eyelids were gone, his genitals were gone, all burnt off. The only piece of his skin that were left was where the seams of his jeans were thickest. That's where the skin didn't come off. That little boy lived for a month, and I'm the one who had to deal with that along with my team. Okay? That was really tough. And the worst part about it, I found out I knew the mom and dad. I just didn't recognize the boy. That was my first scene ever. Okay, so, and, but I've also had the privilege of delivering three babies, and not my own. Okay? That's, that's kind of a gimme as a dad. You go in with the mom, and you get to see that, that little specialty. But I've actually delivered three babies on my own. So it's kind of cool. And most of them, I think one of them now is probably your age, and there's a couple of younger ones. But, so that's, that's the upside. And like I said, there's downsides. So it's not for everybody. If I suggest if you want to get into the fire service, uh, the last incentive you want to be in the fire service is for money. You really, really need to look and do your research and saying, is this something I could do? And this, is this something I want to do? Okay? It's like everybody else may not want to become a teacher. So I mean, people are made to do that. Do your research like anything else. Look into it. Okay. I, one thing I know is once, if you decide to get in a fire service or a paramedic service, once in, nobody leaves. I don't know of anybody who actually leaves. In fact, we just had a guy right now, he just had to retire at 65, and he actually put in a claim on human rights, and we had to bring him back. He doesn't want to go. He loves it. And, and for the most part, like I said, nobody, nobody leaves. And once they get in, they just thoroughly enjoy the job. You have a real sense of worth of what you're doing, and you feel very much part of the community because that's who you work for. So it's really good in that regard. Any other questions?